true. All right, there we go. So today we have Eric Goldfield here. Um, super excited. I was really grateful kind of at the beginning of the school year. I did a shootout into my community of professionals and I was like, hey, last year I did this community collaboration series thing for the first time ever and it went pretty well. Does anybody want to present? And in all honesty, I expected crickets um, as I think we typically get when we ask for volunteers for something. There's that fear of like nobody responding and it being crickets. Um, but he immediately reached out and was like, I would love to do that. Um, so I'm really appreciative of that. And I'm going to let him take over and present today on this very hot topic. Well, yes. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm grateful that some people decided to you know, join us. And if more people want to join and ask any questions, ask any questions at any time. Um, I am going to click on the little present button because I do have a little bit, a few little slides and um, we can, I can go through those a little bit. And if you have any questions, like I said, feel free to stop me. I'm also going to stop at the end. So if you have anything to add or inquire about, feel free to do so. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Let's see here. All righty. There we have it. So, um, yes. Basically, the screams and screens is emotional regulation strategies and also going through some of the concerns, positives, not just negatives, but some of the um, conflict that arises from video games and the interactions within the family system. So which I'm sure if, you know, as parents, you've all um, experienced. So, um, you know, first of all, we're going to get to the pros of screens because it's not all bad. You can't say that they're all bad. You get the little, and sorry, this is this is probably my messiest slide, but you get a nice little dopamine hit. Everybody likes that. Um, it's sociable. So, you know, the, and that's the argument that I hear the most in, in, in terms of the pros for video games is that, you know, well, Timmy's doing it. I need to connect with my friends. Everybody's online. Um, they, you can connect online via multiplayer and via chat features in most game forums. You know, you talk about it at school. It's a common interest-based theme. So, you know, not only are you connecting through the video game, but you're, um, you know, you're gaining knowledge and insight into something that is a very commonly shared interest. Um, neurodivergent. So a lot of us have experienced parenting neurodivergent individuals. Um, and so, you know, that's also a positive thing for them in terms of it's something that usually we grasp quite easily. I'm throwing myself into that mix. And we can excel at these games and you connect more easily than through traditional socializing, whereas, you know, interpreting social cues, interacting face to face can be difficult. But through these games, we can get a sense of community a little bit easier. A lot of us go into careers and success can be linked to online screen usage, because if you want to be, you know, software engineer, video game designer, and I'm just like throwing out like the basics, there's a lot of careers and, um, you know, jobs that stem from screen usage and the more advanced we get technologically, the more that's going to increase as well. Also, let's, you know, let, let's just, you know, talk about the elephant in the room real quick. It's also a break for parents. Um, we all enjoy our screens. I know most of you enjoy watching Downton Abbey and your Snuggies. That's more so me. I admit, I love that show. And, uh, you know, we all like our little screens. So, I also compiled a little video here, um, you know, just kind of like an introductory video because it's not all bad. Like I said, I want to touch base on the pros and you're going to hear about the pros from your children as well. So um, let's go ahead and start this guy here. into it. I'm told it started as a team building exercise. How big's your TV? Because I want to know if you can see what's happening. Oh, wow. You beat a 12-year-old. I don't care if you're 12 years old. 
You have more time in the day to play. I live in the real world, my man. Video games have been doing all kinds of strange things to children. Where are all my games? No Dead Rising? No Crackdown? Hey. Sold out in 20 minutes. Suddenly, one woman punched her grandma right in the throat. Same family, too. Ah. Okay, so yes, I did take some video clips from movies and shows and stuff. Some of my personal favorite, you watch The Office, right? So, you know, like we're getting to the social component of things and then the dysregulation of it, which is going to stem from any time you get a lot of dopamine hits at once. And uh, there's a big draw of video games. So being detached from that or being too involved with that is going to create some dysregulation. It's just going to do it. Now, obviously, a lot of those scenes are exaggerated, and hopefully uh, no animals were really hurt because that would be very messed up. But the draw video games, you know, it's very interactive, like we talked about before, which is a pro, by the way. I'd say for the most part, unless you're playing a grown man like Vince Vaughn represented in that, in that film, The Breakup, which is a great one, because there are no filters really on who you can play with. Now, I know a lot of you parents are familiar with the settings and who you can befriend in terms of groups and gameplay, especially multiplayer play. So that's very important. Uh, it's reward-based. We talked about the dopamine, but it's also achievement-based. So you feel you literally get trophies in a lot of these games, uh, level ups, um, achievements. And so that is very rewarding, and that hits on the dopamine as well. So it's like a double dopamine hit. It's skill building. Um, you can develop certain skills and knowledge, and you're proud of these skills when you can actually put into play if you're playing any third base, uh, third person combat scenario games, FPS, first person shooter, sports games, Minecraft games, when you're able to do something for the first time in those games, that's that's another dopamine hit. And these are readily accessible, so it's right there. You know, um, I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with how you know we can just get out of our bed and access screens. It's entertaining. So whether it be graphics, even low poly games, there's an entertainment component that's very appealing to us. And they're challenging. They challenge us to beat them by rewarding us for doing so. And also giving us a little sense of pride when we're able to do that and share that with our peers, right? So talk about the chemicals that you get with dopamine, but it's not just dopamine. So we're going with the happy chemicals here that are all courtesy of your limbic system. You got the dopamine, endorphins, oxytocin, and serotonin, and these these basically help us not only regulate ourselves, but make us feel happy. Now, if you get too much of one, it could also be dysregulating, primarily the dopamine one. And that's why we started with that. I like to use a metaphor of comparing, you know, different neurochemicals to house guests, right? So we start with, with the dopamine here. And that's from the playing the video games, screens, eating certain types of food, particularly ones that are high in sugar and carbs completing winning things. So like I said, double or triple from video games in a lot of cases. Um, dopamine is like the party animal that comes over to your house, trashes your house, in invades your pantry, you know, uh, takes things even. Um, really a lot of fun, cranks the music up loud, but then leaves very quickly. And after it's gone, your house is destroyed, right? So after you get hit, after you get your dopamine hit, you can feel immediately like, well, I need that again. Where did it go? Right, because now I'm left with this kind of destructive, destructive, you know, environment that is all courtesy of this bad and fun house guest. Oxytocin, um, that's the love drug, right? You can get that from playing with a dog. dog. I like dogs, but you can use cats or any other animal, really. Talking with peers and family, face-to-face -face social interaction, holding hands, hugging, snuggling, watching a movie. Talkative, friendly house guest. So it doesn't want to leave, but it is very friendly. You know, it asks you how you're doing. It really cares about how you're doing. You feel connected. And then it stays a little too long, but that's okay. Serotonin, that's the relaxation that's going outside, sitting and or walking in nature, meditation, listening to calming music, et cetera. That really helps regulate us. And, you know, one thing that I, that it's a common theme when I ask, you know, clients or young people, um, heck, even my own children, uh, what do you do to relax? They usually say video games, watching TV, playing on my phone. But that's not the relaxation. Dopamine is not the relaxation drug. That's the serotonin. So you ha would literally have to go outside, sit, be calm, uh, meditate, 
I'm not saying that you have to meditate, but listening to calming music without falling asleep, reading, um, that's the overly respectful house guest. It comes, it brings a gift basket. It's very boring. It's like your mom's friend. It's like, oh, how are you doing? Oh, it's so nice to see you. Brings you things. It's very nice. Cleans up after themselves. Like the house guest that you want, but it's very boring to talk to. You don't like, no kid loves serotonin. It's just not the most fun. And then, of course, endorphins, that's from exercise and physical exertion. High energy house guest, right? Cleans up after itself, but stays a little too long. And then you're usually exhausted when they leave. Now, if you get your daily dose, then you're usually more regulated and happier from doing that. A lot of times we don't get all of these chemicals on a daily basis. And that could really mess with our ability to regulate, especially if your brain is developing and you're a child. So, and, and I always say, you know, if we're going back to, you know, our biological predispositions, we were meant to get our dopamine at the end of the day, uh, you know, by doing things, tasks, chores, building things, you know, creating things. We usually start off, we have to get, you know, we have to interact with other peers or people. If we're, I'm just saying, building a log cabin, you have to talk to people, you have to be outside, you have to take your breaks, right? And then you have to exert yourself. And then when you're done, you get that dopamine hit. But nowadays, it's kind of flip flop. Even though our brains are the same biologically engineered things, we still, you know, need our dopamine usually to come at the end. But we were used to getting it at the beginning. We used to get up, we get on our phones. Parents are guilty of this. I'm guilty of this. And then we start our day and then we usually get in reverse order if we get it at all. So one thing I like to talk about with regulation and screens is the expectations of children and adolescents, teens when they get on them. So most gamers, and this goes for any kind of screen usage as well as phones, you know, begin games either subconsciously or consciously expecting to finish, uh -huh. right? Nobody starts a video game. This is me included here. I'm throwing myself in the mix, expecting to get off in the middle of it. And I know a lot of times I hear a lot of conflict arising. They're like, just five more minutes, right? Because you can't stop if you haven't finished him in Mortal Kombat or gotten the victory in Fortnite, or built the the the, the cabin or the house or the fort in, in, in Minecraft. You, you can't just stop in the middle of it. Stopping a video game prior to its conclusion or beating it can create an automatic bartering for dopamine scenario where you have, you know, you're engaged in a in an argument or it's a plea kind of scenario. And if they have to get off, it's not going to end well in a lot of cases, not not every case, but in a lot of them. If forced to quit early, most gamers will display hostile not hostile, I mean, like, let's, I'm not saying that they're going to come at you, but hostile emotions, aggressive emotions, frustration, sadness towards those they are now interacting with. So I like to have, you know, you know, people verbalize their expectations in realistic ones, such as, you know, I'm going to get off when it's, you know, after the hour or when dinner is ready or when I hear the alarm and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, I'm, I'm going to get off then as opposed to, when we're thinking, I'm going to get off when I'm done, because that usually doesn't correlate well or coincide with when they need to get off. And so that is going to create some dysregulation there, too, probably. So who knows what that is, what the picture that is? Is anybody? Can you hear me? Does anybody know what that is? Trivia question. Anybody? Anyone? Is Carrie? it Pavlov's dog? Boom! Whoever said that, congratulations. I can't see right now because I'm in the slides. But yes, that is Pavlov's dog. So this is a basic example of classic conditioning. Right now, I'm more of a behaviorist. So there's operational conditioning as well at play with video games. But we're not going to. This is the basic. You hear the bell. You get the food. Dog salivates when it hears the bell. So by hearing a voice followed by a negative prompt or expectation, you know, you can become conditioned to respond aggressively or negatively to the sound precipitating the action. So if I hear mom's voice, it's usually the mom, dad, dad too. I'm not just throwing dads under the bus, but it's usually mom that uh, is the voice precipitating the prompt of, hey, you're going to have to get off, right? And so when they hear that voice associated with that, immediately when they hear mom's voice, and this can, this can kind of also apply to other situations. You're just hearing mom's voice in general when you're around the house doing a preferred task, you might, what? What, mom? What? Oh, gosh. Oh, right. So taking away the sound of a voice is what I like to do, if possible, replacing it with an alarm or Alexa. I know we're using tech to 
you know, kind of counteract tech here, but replaces the sound of a parent's voice that immediately after the unwanted prompt usually has to interact with the individual in a different capacity, right? So if you're telling your child to get off screens and then you're going to be spending time with them, you probably don't want them highly irritable and hearing your voice as the negative prompt, you know, telling them to put down their, take away their dog food. Having positive exchanges before introducing the stimulus also helps, you know, reduce tensions. So, you know, having positive exchanges before you kind of even, they even get on the video games, you know, hug, nice little conversation. Um, if they, if they just run in and they don't really talk to you or engage with you at all, and they get on the video games and then you're telling them to get off, that can create a conflictual atmosphere. You also have a positive stimulus introduced immediately afterwards, such as, I mean, you know, we could, we could do just the classic operant conditioning thing of where you get off and here is, you know, you, the little mouse presses the lever and it gets a little food, right? So you can give them, you know, a little treat or something, or you can, you know, give them a token if you're using a behavior modification system. But a positive stimulus would be usually, you know, something of that sort. And then you create a more positive emotional response there. Um, it was Virginia Satire, the, um, the, the world famous, she's proclaimed as the mother of family psychotherapy at UNC Chapel Hill. You know, coping is the problem. The problem is not the problem. It's coping with the problem. That is the problem. So what I like to do or what, what, you know, if we're going back to the happy chemicals is introduce some serotonin, some sensory based coping, right? Like the oils, that's, that's directly associated with your hippocampus there. You're going to smell something and that could uh, stimulate a memory response, a very calm response, stress ball, small taste item. Uh, we talked about that as a, as a positive reinforcer, a visual aid, something that they like to look at, a picture of your dog in an elf costume or something ridiculous. You know, that's good. Independent coping for five to five minutes before re-engaging with parents can also help. Boredom. A lot of kids complain about boredom. We've all done that in the past. Boredom was unavoidable. Now it's highly avoidable. And that creates a problem because if I'm so used to being stimulated and that's the way I get out of boredom, then boredom is not okay. But if it is okay. And in fact, in some cases it's necessary because if you have boredom and then you go down to the for a moment, you're not going to be as irritable because it's not as boring because you're not comparing it directly to what you were doing previously, which was I was gaming against this 40 year old man that my parents don't know about hopefully not and now i'm sitting there at the dinner table and you're asking me how my day was and i'm eating mashed potatoes that's boring so independent coping is great i love legos legos are just fantastic i'm a big fan of legos myself but the sensory based coping is a great way to relax prior to re-engaging you know and this is some statistics basically we're going down here um like i said i'm not completely anti-games. I don't want everybody thinking I'm anti-games because I play them. But if you see here, these are the statistics and there's they're mirrored in a lot of studies, but this is from the Gaming Addiction Weebly. Um, do you think you're addicted? You have you know less than 10% saying yes. And then you have almost 50% saying, I am neglecting duties to play games in this other chart that's correlated with this study, which is the baseline definition of addiction. I am there's an impairment in functioning here. I'm neglecting duties to do something that's giving me dopamine. That's the baseline definition of addiction, right? So if you look here, this is done for teenagers and college students, by the way. So I don't want it to kind of correlate too much with younger children, but it's worth taking a look at. So day spent playing every day is a majority of people in the study spent every day. That Every day they would spend several hours playing. Do you feel angry when you can't play? Um, you know, 50% said never, but, um, you know, 15% said sometimes I, you know, me, there's a whole concept of rage gaming when you're playing particularly sports games for some reason. Um, there's a high correlation between anger and emotional dysregulation and, um, competitive games. Um, now that does not mean that you're breaking stuff or walking around like the Hulk, but the irritability can turn into anger later on if like we talked about before if you're interacting with family members or you're forced to get off when you're not done uh the noticeable symptoms these are more physiological symptoms i don't want to get too much into that but the change in eating habits is something that can occur especially for teenagers so i engage you know i encourage parents to talk to their kids about 
in the family in a problem solving kind of way of like, where are the impairments? Because nobody's going to sit there and say that they're addicted, as you can tell by that chart, unless they know what, what we're looking for. So the impairments of social functioning is one way to tell that there's a big problem. If you're not engaging with peers or family members outside of video games, you're staying isolated in your room. I don't know how many times I hear that, you know, he never comes out of his room or he doesn't want to sit down and, you know, do things with us. That That's an impairment of social functioning. You can't have success in any type of relationship, job or career. If you, I mean, you could be a writer, an author or a software engineer, sure, but you're still going to have to engage socially at some point. Impairments in self-care, you know, that would be for, you know, I'd say children above the age of six, obviously not showering, brushing teeth, your sleep patterns are off. These are indications, impairments in mood. So these are the four, four kind of uh, four gauges that we use, or I like to use social functioning, self-care, mood, impairments in work or school. So the mood would be irritable. Are you irritable after you get off them? Are you arguing a lot? Is there an anger or a flat affect? Like, is you just kind of seem like you're, I'm not catatonic, but kind of flat as if everything else is boring. You're not really engaged. That's an impairment in mood too. impairments in work or school. The grades going down, not completing or turning in work, not doing chores like that. That would be a clear impairment in the work or school category. So, you know, last slide here and then we'll get to kind of some some, some more points, but consequences. So I'm not a huge fan of obviously, you know, I don't like emotional consequences unless it's like positive, but the natural problem solving, logical and unrelated consequences are kind of four styles of consequences. So I don't like the unrelated or the natural ones. The natural ones would be, well, if you don't get off video games when it's dinner time, you're just going to miss dinner time. Well, they want to miss dinner time. Maybe not if it's like steak and potatoes or something, but they would trust me. They would much rather be flipping on their phone or, or, or getting their dopamine hits online than, you know, getting to a salad portion of dinner or something. So I, that doesn't really work. Or even if you're like, well, you're going to miss dessert. Eh, you know, I like the, the, the logical one and the problem solving. The problem solving consequences is when you engage with, um, you know, the child and you talk about the problem. This is what we expect. What are your thoughts on this? And you kind of hear them out about it. Um, and the logical consequence would be if you don't get off video games, you lose video games the next day. It's a correlated consequence. It's a logical one. For instance, if you know, you're know you out and about and let's say they're dysregulated at, I'm just going to use this. Okay. I'm not saying I go here or anything. There's anything wrong with going here if you do. But Walmart, and they're having a serious temper tantrum that's completely unrelated to screens. And you're saying, well, you know, now you're going to lose your screens. Well, that doesn't make any sense. It's not correlated with their behavior at that time or their dysregulation. So then you're just being the bad guy. And that's harder to process if it's unrelated or not correlated at all. So I like the logical and the problem, so problem solving method of consequences for screens if you're going to use that. Also, you know, talk about screens a lot and talking being knowledgeable in what your child is playing and then engaging a little bit in conversations about it right so not in, obviously immediately after perhaps they get off of it but talking to them about what they're doing in a game or what they're accomplishing because a lot of these games are achievement based you know even social media which i'm not encouraging that children get by the way but it's how many followers how many likes how many levels what are you building? What have you accomplished? It's achievement based. And if we're completely disconnected from that, what ends up happening is usually, you know, they don't get it. They just hate video games. Sure, maybe you don't love video games, but that doesn't mean that you don't respect your what your child likes to do or your teenager likes to do. So having engaged conversations about it and learning more about it from them is also helpful. So there you go. I'm going to stop sharing here. Where am I? There I am. And there are more people here. There are more people. I only have, there's two people sleeping. No, no, we're good. Everybody's good. Excellent. So, you know, that was just basically some, some thoughts on that. Now, look, I, I will say this. There's, there's a strong faction right now of people who are very pro gaming and very anti gaming. Right. And so I'm kind of towards the anti gaming because I know the effects of it. But at the same time, I understand that it can be a nice place for people with neurodivergence to go connect with other kids, have some common interests. 
So it's not the worst thing in the world to have it. That being said, if they're not boundaries or guidelines around it, that could be, it could be very bad. All right. Questions. Let's get some, let's get some dialogue popping. Who's got some questions? All right. So before we jump into that, I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. So um, everyone knows. So because this is going to be the end of the recorded version, Eric, I want to take this moment to thank you for that wonderful presentation and all of that information. I know even myself was sitting here jotting down notes. So thank you very much. And I will stop the recording. Sure.